well, boys. Looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? Need you, dream you, find you, taste you, fuck you, use you, scar you, break you. I think that's the order. Yeah. Right? Why did you do that? Actually, that's my stages of grief as I'm going through today's Killapalooza. Uh, okay. Uh, my name is Eric, and uh, you're Michael. I am Michael. You are in here. Fact. Uh, we're doing four. It's a it's a short one. Four phantasm movies four today. phantasm movies what, what you should have opened with instead of the amount of films was instead we're doing a killapalooza today raise everybody's hopes <laughs> four then, phantasm films bring them right back down i don't know if it's the taste you or the fuck you phase that i like the best but definitely not the scarring or breaking which uh-huh. we will surely get to um you are not a t-shirt guy i'm not a t-shirt guy. however i noticed today instead <laughs> of your usual uh let's say attire you are wearing a Reverend Zombies House of Voodoo New Orleans T-shirts. I am wearing that. But like, uh, where did this thing come from? What I, is this? It came from it came from New Orleans. I went down to New Orleans. Okay, first of all, pause. You left Chicago. I left Chicago and on a whim for no reason. My, a mutual acquaintance of ours wanted absinthe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you yourself an absinthe drinker? No, not not at all. But I am myself an avid uh, traveler when it comes to getting there for free. Yeah, okay. Um, So I went down to New Orleans, and much to my shock, I think I pissed all over Bourbon (laughs) Street. And, like, not not for the reasons everybody else was. Right. When I turned the corner and saw that Reverend Zombie's House of Voodoo is a real fucking place. It is an actual place in New Orleans. So for those of you that that aren't aware, uh, Reverend Zombie's House of Voodoo is uh, an iconic portion of the uh, hatchet Certainly. Uh, franchise, which uh, you're also sporting. Yeah, in actually, form today. speaking of which. So did you go in? What was this I place? did. I went in. It was amazing. It, I mean, it was a... Can you tell me something about it? a very serious voodoo shop. We're going to get to Phantasm, but yeah. I have to... I mean, is it this... Do you think the interior was used for... Oh, not at all. No? Not, so even, just... not even a little bit. But it's a very serious voodoo shop. They take it 100% seriously. Oh, You're not beautiful. allowed to take pictures of like things because they wow. will scare the curses out of them or whatever. This is amazing. Um, And everybody's really sullen and grumpy. And when you ask them, which one, which doll should I buy? Which is a good souvenir? The answer is always something like, all the dolls have been blessed with the same blessings. Choose the one that you think is the right doll because it's probably calling to you because of something yada 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 i bought a t-shirt that has a scary face <laughs> it does have a scary and face. just says zombies house of voodoo it kind of looks like a little plan nine action yeah. there it's uh it's completely nondescript beautiful um, as I far as voodoo it. goes i don't mean to take it seriously but i couldn't pass up the chance to own that shirt because you can't that's not a online no thing. certainly not Oh, love it. I'm going to take a picture of that, I think. We'll put it on the website or something. Sweet. Website is donate.doublefeatureshow.com. Why don't you just use use that direction to yeah. get to it, that address. Um, this is our, I think, our second Killapalooza of the year. So our second Killapalooza of the year, 14th, but 14th overall. Total. Cannot believe that is a real number. Thanks, everybody. Um, we're, we're still going through them. We're doing the ones people request. Kind of. And, uh, we're skipping a few that people well, continue to request. We'll get back to them. Too um, many puppets. <laughs> there's, there is one small favor uh, I will ask of our audience. Okay. Donate.doublefeatureshow.com. We had to fight with our input box for, oh, I don't know, 12 hours yeah. before we were actually able to record the show. Right. And I had a lot of really exciting, amazing things to say that I've permanently forgotten forever. Yeah, you did. We need to replace this thing. So give us some money. Instead, I'm going to give you all of the crap that's left over that I remember. And that'll compose today's show, which I believe includes spoilers. It not only includes spoilers, but it also includes chapters, which you can use to avoid the spoilers. And we'll right. have it divided up by film. So if you want to skip through all the Phantasm films, sure. the whopping, I'm not going to say quadrilogy, the whopping no, foursome that. Sure. that is foursome is Phantasm, much better. Sure. Um, then you can just skip right on. Uh, you could skip to the second, skip to the third, skip to the end. And, uh, I like that you once again assume our audience does not know how to count to four. That's good. I just, I, it's not an assumption. Uh, it's an educated guess. I would like 
if I may, to take you on a strange journey into the first Phantasm film, <laughs> which uh, came out in 1979. Came out in 1979. Um, this opens with the man with no neck. How did yep. he get in here? I don't know. It's weird because... Or I guess Angus Scrim doing his take on yeah, the man with right. no neck. Well, eventually he kind of accordions out and <laughs> sure. becomes the tall man. Yeah, but right. But not before um, doing this weird little desk jockey gig of... Sure. Uh, I guess he he talks about the film. He he clues. He us points in. out he's a better actor than yep. he got. So if you haven't seen this particular copy of right. the movie, this is the new anniversary edition something I know. box set whatever. It uh it opens with Angus Grimm talking about the movie a little I, bit. I don't like when this happens. Spoiling the movie. <laughs> yeah, actually, exactly. I don't like when this happens. So I completely tuned him out to write down Rocky Horror Picture Show jokes. But uh, you were listening. He said he, he basically well, told you what the movies I had were about. Seen, yeah, I had seen. The first Phantasm film. Sure. Similarly to when we did uh, The Last Killapalooza, which was um, Silent Night, Deadly uh, Night. Night. Yes. I had seen the first one and then not seen any of the sequels. So I n- had seen it, but to be completely honest, had no fucking idea what <laughs> right. went on in right. the original That's still Phantasm how I feel, film. but yeah. So I was listening very carefully to Angus Scrim's, uh, I guess, a dissertation of... Sure his his experience with phantasm and one one thing i learned for sure is that it's pronounced coscarelli okay good. i wasn't sure if it was coscarelli or coscarelli so i was glad he clued us in on that but also he just kind of tells you what the movie's about which still includes a lot more uh dimensions time travel and martians than i had far anticipated more. also um more accordion corpses yeah yeah there's that too well, that part I would I would sort of get by the end of the first film. But why, though? You have to start at the beginning, which is, uh, by the That's way... That's a very good place uh, to start. Once again, two people fucking. You mm-hmm. know my favorite opening for a film is just two people fucking. Slasher franchises, totally getting it right. So already, uh, this series has completely won me over. Mm-hmm. There's nearly nothing that it can do wrong uh, from this point on. We have Reggie Bannister actually playing Reggie a Bannister, character... Who plays Reggie. ...named Reggie. And uh, Michael Baldwin playing Mike. Okay. Young Michael Baldwin at this point in the franchise. Little Michael Baldwin. And then uh, Angus will show up later as uh, who I guess we'll call the tall man. So we're keeping everything pretty stripped down, pretty basic. And we start in Morningside and already the movie has a lot of tact too. Because when you start in Morningside, which is some kind of uh, gated mansion graveyard. It's a gated mansion graveyard uh, mausoleum mausoleum thing. Right. Funeral parlor. So easily you could have made Morningside a pun Mm -hmm. just in the spelling. And maybe the movie overlooked it or maybe they chose the high road. Sure. Let's uh, assume positive intent here. High road. And I love the design of this mausoleum funeral home thing. What is it a mausoleum? Is it a mansion? What this place is fucking big. It's it's huge. There's just marble hallways yeah, lined right. with drawers containing sure. the dead. Sure. Um I don't know if anybody would live there. Well, then again, we there's someone that lives there. Uh, I don't think it's really a house. I just think it's a place for bad things to happen. Well, and that's all we need. You know, and having such a large uh interior spot like that you basically, you live in a corn maze. Sure. I mean, that's this is the spooky corn maze from any other slasher film, right. just nested inside a giant mansion. This is really what Amityville should have done. Right. It's made the house huge and unknown and scary, a, a big jigsaw puzzle. Uh-huh. Yeah, so it's all that Marvel stuff. It's the black and white and the red accents and the corridors like we're in uh, fucking Doom 3. Actually, by the time we have these chrome sphere things flying around, and uh, we're shotgunning at them. I kind yeah. of feel like we're just playing Half-Life. Yeah. And then I guess the score would be the other component outside of the visuals and the actors. And the score, and, you know, maybe this is just because we've been on a little Argento kick. And sure. I'm kind of into that. But how are you feeling about the Argento these days? I, I'm getting I'm getting uh, cravings, I guess is a good yeah, way to put it. Yeah, isn't that weird? That it's, just uh, kind of appears. Cra- I, so I crave... I crave Giallo and I crave Argento and then I watch it and I still don't really love it. <laughs> yeah, you're it. still not sure how, why you're watching it, but, but then I you have the urge to go to back. Watch it. Yeah. The score in this movie is basically a cheap American Goblin cover band. Yeah, right? that's, I mean, that's absolutely what it is. It's yeah. that kind of lazy drum, sure. pawn shop, bass, sort of. The guitar that the main character is actually playing on his own porch. Right. And then the keyboard that's kind of, um, you noted this as we were watching it about the muscle cars. So if you were to get a hand-me-down car today, uh-huh. you would get what a 
You'd get uh, a you'd get a teal Ford Taurus, <laughs> right? Right, but in the seventies and the eighties, you get a it's like oh, I got this shitty nineteen seventy three Dodge Charger. See, that's how I feel about synthesizers. Right, I feel like in the eighties you couldn't walk you know two feet into. I was going to make a Radio Shack joke, but it probably wasn't. I don't know where people got these. It's a uh, it's a giant mystery to me. But everywhere you went, every crappy eighties band had the most amazing vintage keyboards. And we look back now and we go. Wow, these keyboards, they're, you know, they're rare and they're hard to get and they're a million dollars on eBay and they sound great. They sound like shit. They sound like in this movie. But th- now that, yeah. you know, that sound audibly, that's great. And uh and today's cheap keyboards are actually they're MIDI keyboards. They don't even make yeah, sounds. They don't so make I feel noise. the same way about keyboards that you do about uh cars. I, I guess 80s muscle cars, yeah. 70s hand-me-downs. So the tall man is our, I guess, for all intents and purposes of the Killapalooza, he would be our slasher. Is that how that works? He's our antagonist. He never slashes. I guess that's uh, true. He walks in a very menacing way. Sure. His eyebrow could uh, maybe be considered a weapon. You know, after the last Killapalooza, I'm not going to make any eyebrow jokes. That's a personal vow I've made to myself and now to our audience. All right. That's fair enough. He looks super fucking boss, though. Yeah, he does. I mean, the kind of swift almost this feminine sort of yeah. walk he has well, especially with such a dumb haircut yeah right hey that's the carl sagan haircut you're mocking there sir you watch uh you anybody watch who has that haircut has a dumb haircut and he always seems to be backlit as he's walking yep. through doors you never really see him go anywhere unless he's passing by an ice cream truck i guess mm-hmm. but he's always walking through these fucking doors in slow motion and you have the you know, the light all around him and I guess the distinctive haircut. You're right. Sure. I do think of the haircut. I oh, do yeah. think of that weird swoop thing yeah. that's going on there. So he's part of the uh, the role of the antagonist sure. in these movies. But also those little chrome sphere things, yeah. the right. reflective ball. What are these? What is this about? Uh, they fly around. They kind of like siphon blood out of Right. Body. Okay. They siphon fluid out of your body because. So in the first movie, there's only what two scenes with the yeah. the little things in them. Right. And they uh, they kind of stick out these little razors, mm-hmm. and they get stuck in your forehead. It, it appears that it has to be the forehead yeah. at this point. And uh, yeah, I guess you're right. They siphon the blood out. Are they siphoning the blood out so the nacho cheese can go in, or when? I, you know, I think when that, does the cheese whiz enter the equation? I here? think that the spheres are solely there to kill things. I think they're kind of like a security system. Sure, okay. And <laughs> or, I mean, or that's all we know yet. Yeah, exactly. The first time we get nacho cheese, and I want to talk about that because that's a weird... I've always been a blood fan over a... Uh, let's nacho say cheese a, fan. A pus fan. But it's, it's even stranger than... I think it's more gross than getting any kind of gore is seeing... A, what is it? It's when the finger's severed. That's yeah. the first time you see this sort of... I mean, it does look like some kind of stale melted cheese that's mm-hmm. been left out. I assume that's the method they're using. It's really disgusting. And yellow, when do you ever see the, that? It's never yellow. I've seen blue blood and black blood green. and green blood. Ah, yellow blood. Interesting choice. I'm going to say Don has some kind of obsession with yellow liquids because it's not the only one we see in this movie. <laughs> kind of another uh, standout scene. What, where the dude pisses himself? Yeah, right. When does that happen? Are you asking when does it happen in the film or when does it happen ever in film? I meant in the history of yeah, cinema. It but... doesn't. It's weird because everybody kind of has this knowledge in the back of their mind, or at least most people do. I don't know if I'm going to drop the bomb on everybody. Okay. Uh, when you die, you shit your pants. And when you have a baby, you shit the bed. Thank Those you, things... uh, South Park and Skeptic, respectively. And so it makes sense that this guy dies and thusly pisses all over the floor especially because he's terrified sure but it's weird because you never see it and it's uncomfortable you asked if it was blood yeah well i didn't know (laughs) what the movie was doing it seems uh this is about the closest this movie gets to a joke yeah the first one is super serious it is or at least maybe deadpan no i think it's just straight serious i think that's absolutely it you know it kind of follows a little bit of a slasher convention mm-hmm. and a little bit of a Star that, Wars convention. You know, I wasn't going to give the franchise any shit until the fourth film, but uh, I guess there's a little Star Wars going on in here too. And then eventually guns come out. So yeah. there there we go right away saying, all right, not so much a slasher movie. Now we're going to bulk up and make this an action film. But the first, uh, I guess the first time you see guns, he's got one pointed at his own head trying to get the Jawa off his back. Right. Which is really what we're all doing in life, I think, is trying yeah. to get the Jawa off our back. Just a metaphor. But the first couple of movies are all about functionality, too. 
you have the um, the shotgun shell scene thing. Right. Oh my god. So, so somehow good. a door is opened with a shotgun yeah. shell. Is well, that? I mean, it's it's really a very logical procedure. Mike is locked in his bedroom, and he wants to get out. So okay. he has a shotgun shell in his pocket. <laughs> he tapes it to a hammer with a push pin in between sure. to ignite the primer, and then he slams it on the door, blows a hole in it, and then unlocks the door. Kind of glory hole style. And uh, then glory he's hole room. style. I'm sorry. Am I just supposed to let you get away with that? Yeah. So in case you couldn't relate, uh, yeah, you know, like a glory hole. Thanks, <laughs> yeah. thanks, Michael. Appreciate that. It gets him out of the room. So I guess whatever works. It, it's uh, these moments that you remember back from the first one that uh, I don't want to, you know, it's we're already in the first movie. We have to start throwing out the word iconic, right? That's uh-huh. just how it goes. On well, Double Feature. the first one has to be the iconic one. But here we're dealing with that. Uh, this is an interesting question as we'll kind of go through the four movies. What do they bring in each film? What sure. comes back? Do they have any kind of foresight to say, oh, we're going to make sequels? Sure. Now, this is the same camp of people. and We'll talk right. about this more as the other films come up. Same fucking people right. in almost every movie. Which is the first time this ever happened. Yeah. We have the same writer-director for all four films. So these will be his choices when, when certain elements sure. come back. For better or for worse. So we get to the end of the first film. And looking back, having ignored what the man with no neck said, I don't know what this is a movie about. Uh-huh. I know in the end there's a white room with some barrels, which is totally fucking hip. And there's the scary mirror ending. Sure. So this starts uh, what really should be a staple for all slasher movies. Well, but prior to the scary mirror ending, because mm-hmm. that, that would be a great note to kind of just transition into maybe the second You film, see what I'm doing here. What we need to cover is another staple that happens, which is at the end of the film, reality resets. Oh, sure. It always right. goes... Because in the end of this film, you and I were actually really confused and taken aback because... We both remember seeing Reggie die, but at the end of the film, Reggie's Reggie just alive comes back. Yeah, he's fine. And Jody's dead. Whoops. And we're going, what? How did? I'm, How did that happen? Wait, is there? Is that not Reggie? No, it's a ponytail. Yeah, yeah, it's got to be Reggie. Sure. It's not a Hellraiser thing. Sure. But it sets this precedent for the reality of this situation is skewed and resettable, which actually plays into the overall plot sure. of Phantasm. And brings us to the end of the first Phantasm film up in the, I guess, what, the bathroom at... Yeah, this would be somewhere in line with um, Sleepaway Camp or the the first Jason movie as far as, you know, memorable ending, first of the franchise. And uh, that fucking mirror ending is great. It's goddamn. And then there's credits. Yeah. Perfect. Go to credits. Tall Man gets the last word. That's what you want to happen. Perfect. Directed by Don Coscarelli. And so, nearly 10 years later, yeah. there is Phantasm 2. It takes Phantasm a while two. to get that off the ground. So, apparently, Phantasm uh, found some love over the decade. And, uh, and they make a second one, which is great because the first one didn't make any fucking sense. Uh-huh. I mean that in the nicest way. Yeah. You know, the movie doesn't have to make sense. Nope. A film like this is about, uh, firstly, being creepy. Secondly, being scary, I guess, part of that, that slasher. I mean, whatever being a we're 14 in and i still don't know what a slasher franchise is about but whatever it's about it is being that slasher franchise mm-hmm. and i suppose the third is being a little trippy yeah. right that's that's kind of how it stands out from yeah these other films coming out around the time so when we get to a second we're going to elaborate on this world a little bit we're going to learn a little bit more about the mythology right and uh given that there's only four films i'm wondering how fast how hard we're going to dive sure. into this stuff well i think one of the biggest separations that we see a lot of in the second film is that this is not just horror no but it's sci-fi horror sure and i think there's more laser beams yeah there's laser beams you kind of get an idea that there's an interplanetary thing going on sure there's kind of a you know Plan 9 from Outer Space plot line under Now you're thinking about Plan everything. 9. Yeah. But the thing is, is in all of these Killapaloozas, we rarely get one that's based in sci-fi. We did Alien sure. and Predator. Yeah. Right? That's based in sci-fi. Certainly. Jason X is in space. Sure. Leprechaun 4 is in space. But that doesn't mean it's a sci-fi franchise. Yeah, those movies prove that. So we get Phantasm, which is first and foremost a horror franchise, mm-hmm. but based in a sci-fi reality yeah with ponytails well and the ponytail comes back so we start to get some of our crew back here 
we uh, we have a pretty immediate sequel. And although the actors look 10 years older, sure. they're interested in telling us these characters' stories. Still, sure. this isn't just about the right. adventures of the tall man. Which it totally could be. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we we accepted that everywhere else. We'd yeah. certainly accept it here. But instead, this is this is about a very specific group of people. It's about these three guys mm-hmm. versus the tall man and an army of Jawas. I believe they say that uh, literally later that it's about these three friends. So we see Reggie again, but we also get a new character. We just add this uh, completely arbitrary topless girl into the mix. Right. Which, I mean, I'm not complaining about. If you're adding something into the mix, it should be an arbitrary topless girl. They literally just pick her up off the side of the road as if they need uh, another character. One of the characters starts daydreaming. Hey, wouldn't it be great if we just had a topless chick in this film? Right. Actually, I think he's daydreaming about her naked corpse. But, you know, whatever gets you off. Her name is, and I love this, it's uh, Alchemy. But, you know, Kemi for short. Kemi for short. I'm sad we don't see her around for very long. I guess she makes it through the rest of the film. We have not one, but two ladies in this film. Yeah. We also true. get the strange psychic connection girl. Yeah. Well, that kind of brings me to uh, a little, I guess I'm going to call it a hiccup in okay. the franchise because it Interesting. is All right. essentially beyond the power of the powers that be, mm-hmm. um, which is that we don't get a Michael Baldwin returning as Mike. Oh, yeah. But Michael Baldwin is in the next two films. Yeah. So we almost have uh, the whole cast through all four. Sure. But for whatever production reason, they didn't want Michael Baldwin to come back, so they got somebody else. The guy does a totally fine job. Yeah, it's it's I mean, not like the second Silent Night, Deadly Night or anything. It's to the point where I didn't know for sure if right. it wasn't him. Right, and that's what you want. Yeah. So we're in this middle chunk of movies where we have some girl power. And the other thing that's, I mean, this is really strange, um, not just for a sequel, but really thinking back to anything we've ever done. I can't remember a movie where we started ass-kicking so early in. Yeah, we get the gearing up montage yeah. within 15 minutes. We're gearing up for a climax to a film that hasn't happened yet. Right, exactly. This isn't machete-style blow down the door, I'm going to show you how fucking killer this movie is going to be. This is, hey, you know these characters, it's sure. time to go on the mission. Right. That's the feeling we it's, have here. It's You've already seen these characters, you know their agenda, you know what they're up against, they're not going to pretend it's all okay for a while. Sure. They're going to get down to brass fucking tacks right. and tape two shotguns together. Oh, it's so great. It's such a simple, beautiful idea. It's one of my favorite kind of things a movie can do where they just completely betray a convention. They stop and say, wait, why do we need to you know, go through all this boring work first? Let's just fucking go for it. And I mean, who does that? Yeah. You know, the, um, the thing that makes me love this is one, that it works. Yeah. Even if it didn't work, I would love it. But the fact that we drop this uh, this unnecessary part of the movie where the characters sit around and be boring for a while, and um, we just jump into the action, and it's sure. totally fine. And even if it had not been fine, it would have got us into the action right away, so that's good. But the fact that they perform this experiment, and it completely works, and it hasn't been used just everywhere since then, I think right. that's such a great way to start your, especially slasher sequel. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, we play around so much in the slasher genre on this show because you can do anything and yeah. nobody cares. There's well, nothing off the table. The thing that I've always loved about horror and specifically slasher franchises is with as many rules as there are, 0% of them need to be followed. Right. Absolutely. You can do anything you want. Yeah. And that gives filmmakers a lot of uh, a creative area to play yeah. around in. So we're getting this payoff here that we didn't have to work for at all. I feel like we're completely fucking cheating. And uh, then we have a flaming hunchback apparition going on. It's um, when we get to that scene and it's just a girl crying in the corner with a weird thing coming out of her back. Sure. We're already entering into the territory that, you know, we would have in the more bizarre off the wall heart eating type of uh, slasher sequels. But we're just going to get to it right away. We're right. just going to force our audience to accept that. Well, I I mean, when we were watching it, I likened it to the difference between Evil Dead and Evil Dead 2. Sure. Where Evil Dead comes out and it has to set itself up as a thing. Mm-hmm. And then Evil Dead 2 goes, you get it, we're going to have fun. Yeah. And that's what Phantasm 2 does. They come out of the gate going, it's going to be gorier, it's going to be funnier, it's going to be more fucking badass. Yeah. 
down to grinding up Sam Raimi's bones. I think it's really funny that we're both thinking uh, Evil Dead and then the Sam Raimi mention right. happens, right? I mean, I had literally written in my notes talking about uh, some of the camera stuff, how in the second Phantasm movie, blah, blah, cameras, blah, blah. You know, the cameras being more, um, all of that cinematography being more over the top. They're using a lot of those little Sam Raimi kind of fast push-in shots uh-huh. that are really typical of Evil Dead, but show up in his other work too, where the camera gets in close enough to kind of almost warp a character's face a little bit. You have uh, the shot where the guy gets caught, you know, stabbing the corpse in the coffin right? or uh, through the window in the, in the door, kind of yeah. looking back and forth between that weird little decorative thing. So yeah, I'm thinking about Sam Raimi, and then all of a sudden his name is plastered on a container. Right. So where is this in the the range of time when Evil Dead came out? Uh, this is after both Evil Deads. Okay. But so the first Phantasm came out before both Evil Deads. Ah, so we have a Phantasm, and then yes. in the nearly a decade that follows, we have Evil Dead 1, and I think the year before this, we have right. Evil Dead 2. And then we have Phantasm 2, and then, and then Army of Darkness didn't come out for another couple of years. Now, we mentioned Don Coscarelli at the opening of the show. He's doing all four of these movies. Yeah. We talked about him before when we did Bubba Hotep. Right, which, uh, it's no surprise, contains an actor named Bruce Campbell. Sure. Notably... From um, the Evil Dead movies. Exactly. In fact, I would say, aside from Bubba Hotep, Evil Dead, his most famous... I mean, I don't think sure. people would argue with that, right? No. His most famous films. Yeah, probably Army of Darkness. Sure. And then you have Bubba Hotep and the Evil Dead movies. And then the rest are just a slew of movies. Everybody knows what the cover looks like. And My Name <laughs> right. is Bruce, which everyone saw and was disappointed by. Oh, the angry emails. They're flooding in already. This is the donation show. You're not allowed to say anything mean. I'll, I'll take it back with enough donations. I'll take anything back. I look forward to your printed retraction. So a lot of ties between those two people. We're obviously not the only ones thinking about that. When you talk about the Evil Dead 2 kind of we're having fun. Sure. I mean, this movie, aside from the uh, ass-kicking opening, we have a road chase that ensues right away with a hearse, right. nonetheless. Yeah. We're firing off a quad barrel quad shotgun, gun. which becomes a, another piece of iconography. Yeah, another absolutely. great thing from the series, we have this four barrel shotgun thing we've assembled. Well, and Mike has a flamethrower. I mean, yeah. if I'm Michael Baldwin, I am super pissed I'm not in this movie right now. Well, not only that, but he misses out on being in the film with all the dry humping. Yeah, a little bit of awkward dry humping. Yeah. But, uh, Trying not... to pass it off as hardcore sex, but both parties have clothing on. That was there the second one, out. wasn't it? Yeah. There are tits out, and I asked you if that was his sister. Right, because that's what you're expecting I somewhere expect in this franchise. I always expect the sequel to a horror franchise to have incest now. That's just what we've, we've come to accept. That's where the bar is for me. You know, we were just talking about dry humping on the last kill palooza i i think it was silent night deadly night right because it was the one with the toys sure yeah and i called it something like that wonderful teenage dry hump thing Uh uh-huh this is not a wonderful teenage dry hump thing this is that thing movies do where um actors are still wearing clothes but they're pretending they're fucking yeah very deliberate not cool doesn't make any goddamn sense there's a lot of stuff you can do with clothes on uh, that will make everybody less confused and uncomfortable, sure. including your actors. Having intercourse, not one of them. You're getting me off my track here. I was talking about flamethrowers, man. I'm sorry, flamethrowers. We had a flamethrower, a quad barrel shotgun. The second movie also had the chainsaw. The chainsaw. I mean, we see the chainsaws all over the place. But the chainsaw here, this is what I'm loving, is that this movie is using its weapons for very casual, practical reasons. Sure. It learned something from the the shotgun hammer thing in right. the first movie. Right. It's saying, all right, we're going to use a chainsaw to saw down a door. Weapons can be tools. And we're going to use a flamethrower to light a fucking fire. But that doesn't mean the movie's pulling any punches as far as the gore stuff goes. No, not at all. It's def- I think it's a step above the previous Phantasm film. We get the gold sphere that goes yeah. through the guy's body. Right, right. And a lot of crotch shots. Well, an exploding acid face. I mean, when we finally oh, yeah. take down the tall sure. man, sort of. Right. Uh, His entire body is melting with acid that's going through some kind of um, embalming fluid. It's like an embalming device. They suck out the blood, pump in the embalming, accordion you down to a midget, and then you're a slave. I guess that's making enough sense. I mean, we sort of know by the second movie, there's slaves, there's another dimension, there's accordions. At some point, you convinced me that we're just going to use the term accordioning for uh, yeah. this process. But yeah, his uh, his face is melting and his eyeballs are exploding out of his head. Sure. The eyeballs exploding out of the head is, that's that's class A where yep. you go uh, for slasher material. And when we finally get out of that place, 
we are burning it all down. We just take the flamethrower. <laughs> I mean, we're literally walking out of here, and we've had a, we've had a couple things that haven't paid off, little traps that we have yep. set up. But as we're walking out, thinking to myself, man, didn't really get to use that flamethrower, did you? Burn the whole fucking house down. Yep. Just burn it to the ground. And we pop back in that hearse for a getaway. So I'm yep. thinking, where are we going to go after this getaway? Each movie is, I mean, Michael, they're almost literally all an hour and 30 minutes. Yeah, it's a really word. it's really within a three-minute margin. Beautiful. It's so good. And uh, as we're nearing our hour and 30-minute mark, we're in a getaway in this hearse, and that's where we find out, I believe it's, this is a dream. No, it's not. Well done, sir. And I guess that's just supposed to make sense to us. We're sure. just supposed to go, oh, like in the first movie where some things are real and some things are not right. real. And then break through the window, grab your main character, red text reads, directed by Don Coscarelli. You get the red text and you're excited. You want to watch the movie again. Mid-90s, Phantasm 3. Uh-huh. Has some sort of a tagline that I'm going to ignore. Yeah, We're no, going to call it Phantasm 3. Great. Complete with uh, font still circa the 80s. And we open this movie with retcons aplenty. Yeah, but These they're all really everywhere. well done. They are. So let's kind of cycle through some of this. Sure. We had a little bit of a weird retcon, replace the actor, something going right. on, still show one of the actors yeah, in exactly. the first movie. Well, they basically artfully shot the final scene where the two characters are in the back of the car. Sure. And they see Reggie die. And then mm-hmm. it's the, the psychic female and Mike. And they reshow that scene with psychic female but make sure mike is not to be seen right and then the first time you see mike's face surprise it's mike again michael baldwin has returned so by the third movie we've replaced uh second movie michael baldwin with actual michael baldwin right about 15 years of age yeah the saddest part about replacing uh michael baldwin is the character's name is mike it's clearly just this is a group of friends making movies exactly and they kicked him out for the second one i mean he had to go another massive retcon that we get in the beginning of the film is that reggie is not nearly as dead as slightly less dead at the end of uh the previous film so in the first movie they just expected us to buy that they flat out told us and that's why the movie is you know so funny in doing that because they it's not like they had to do a retcon. They're still within the first film. Mm-hmm. They could just have fixed the plot if that's how they wanted to do it. But they chose to kill a character and then just fucking look in our eyes and tell us he's not dead. Yeah. They made that decision. Now they're going back and they're saying, oh, whoops, we're going to make a third movie. Let's retcon it. We'll show you we can do it the other way. Yeah. So Reggie has um, a tiny cut on his face tiny instead cut. of being and totally some, and brutalized. And some red finger paint. Yeah. And the car blows up because uh-huh. that's that's how we wrap up our loose plot ends. We uh, ship them off in a car which explodes. So now we're no longer left wondering, well, where did the tall man go and how did he d- disappear or whatever? And whose brother's an orb? <laughs> whose brother is an orb? That's a question that may come up again. And so the third movie says, oh, I'm going to ass kick just as well as the second sure, movie. But be a lot funnier about it. And right off the bat, we get the... Uh, aerial quad gun fire oh my god it's so good well the jawa boom the, yeah the single sure. jawa but then shoots it into the tree and jawas fall down yeah jawas fall out of the tree beautiful one at a time clearly being tossed from off camera uh-huh. <laughs> uh into um the frame man they fall out of that tree and i just fucking lose it yeah i just couldn't <laughs> it's so it, it, you know it says a lot about how the tone of this movie is going to be the movie's going to tell some jokes I don't know if the movie's kidding here or being badass, but uh, it is funny. It's I think really it's, funny. I think it's uh, very much in line with Army of Darkness, which has now come out. Sure. You have to keep in mind that if we're going to keep likening this to Evil Dead, which we're totally not, because that would then negate us ever needing to do Evil Dead. And short sell this franchise a little bit. Um, But while we're drawing the parallels anyway. So we get Don Coscarelli has seen Army of Darkness, and Army of Darkness goes even one better more badass and even sillier <laughs> sure so don coscarelli goes okay yeah i can see which I, I can dig i can dig and then he has his uh quad gun toting ice cream man sure shoot down a, bunch a premise of that's always been funny oh, right yeah. the movies never acknowledged that it was it was an ice cream man and therefore this is fucking hilarious so suddenly he's all about being the ice cream man and he's shooting little dwarves out of trees this is our hero the girl, on the other hand, is totally dead. Big dead. Big time. Major dead. She's uh, mutilated to the point of being unrecognizable, and that means she's not coming back. Right. That's how you know. When you see a character fall off a car and roll over in a ditch, 
and it's clearly a different scene than last time, but the actors there were either doing a weird Halloween thing or we totally got that actor back. They are sticking around for the rest of the film. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, we want to know, okay, one girl turned into the tall man, the fun girl, yeah. actually, and then the other girl got so mutilated that we didn't even get the fucking actress back, so right. don't worry about her. Good. We all understand each other now. Great. But we bring in three more female roles. Unfortunately, two of them are insanely short-lived. Yeah. So is the other one, you're, is the other one part of the numbskulls? Is that yeah. the other one you're talking about? Yeah. These, uh, so we have some scavengers, I guess, right? We're introduced they to look these, like rodeo clowns. these three fucking idiots. Um, they're the gang from the third Jason movie. They're the, yeah. uh, the morons from Happy Town. These are characters uh, I know you love and you know I fucking despise. Yep. I hate when these three people show up in movies. <laughs> yep. And so they die right away. <laughs> they die. The movie says, hey, Michael, check these people out. Oh, hey, Eric, they're dead. Don't worry. But they come back. Sure. They come back, and that's funny to me because they I thought I got in a, out of in a, in a very um, Treehouse of Horror esque, like zombies chasing you in a car chase. Sure, <laughs> sure, right. Well, you make it sound slapstick, but I think it's just dark. It it's, is, you know, as we describe it back now, it sounds like Ice Cream Man Assassin. It sounds funny, sure. but um, you know, the if there's anything that's slapstick about the movie, I think it's that we introduce this kid. Right. Mm -hmm. We bring in if we didn't have enough fucking trapped houses in these movies quickly becoming a staple. We uh, bring in Macaulay Culkin, who's basically going to hang out for the rest of the movie. He's sure. going to become a, a pivotal character. Yeah. And is for whatever reason, a dead eye firer. Well, and this is something we actually have to worry about as we're constructing a slasher franchise over this many years. You know, Jason doesn't have this problem. Every summer, back in the summers when Jason movies right. came out, or in October, or whenever the fuck these movies came out, uh -huh. when these movies still existed every couple of years, it was a new camp of kids, and so we're always dealing with teenagers. We're always dealing with mm -hmm. teens or 20-somethings. Right, or and, their parents. Yeah, and so that audience shows up to the movie. Now, by doing something kind of interesting that this franchise does, where it says, hey, I'm Midnight Movie Fun Slasher, come see me. But also, I'm going to have these characters who are going to go from 20 to 45 by the end of this, or probably sure. even older, right? From yeah. 77 to 99. Yeah. Uh, that's a long goddamn time. And so we have to introduce some new characters here and there. We have to, they're always younger faces. I mean, sure. that's no accident. We want to make them a little more identifiable, I guess, with the younger generations right. that might come to see this movie. You know, and here they're not, uh, they're not disguising it at all. They're really appealing to the 10-year-old <laughs> demographic. Right. I mean, nut shots are also becoming a staple That's of true. the franchise. Or I guess it's an axe in the knee. It's an implied nut shot, but it becomes an axe in the knee, so it doesn't count. There is uh, that moment, uh, the that was close moment, when Rocky stabs the creature in uh, Reggie's pants. Right. So yeah, I guess we have Rocky, too. Rocky mm -hmm. is one of the total badass chicks that... Uh -huh. uh, the one that survives. I don't know what they're attempting to do when they find Reggie. Yeah. If they're going to mug him or rape him or steal his wallet or what. But they they try and take him hostage, right. essentially. And, you know, she's the one thing that disrupts this from being a buddy movie. Although, I guess, a lot of times when you have a buddy movie with a kid in it, there is a strange romantic plot sure. thread, too. Well, you because know, the kid is kind of... Uh, doesn't understand romance and it's, sure. <laughs> great, it's right. comic to get him in the way of it i guess yeah this movie is somewhere between paper moon and uh terminator 2 i mean right. i'm getting some really heavy sure. terminator 2 vibes but is that terminator was the same... 2 the one where the guy's brother's an orb terminator 2 is the one where reggie's trying to get laid at the hotel and he has a back and forth with the kid in the car right that is i think uh this is a level of humor that is uncommon anywhere else in the series it never really gets as obvious here is a joke as when, you know, there's he's standing behind Rocky trying to tell this kid, hey, kid, stay in the car. I'm going to bang this chick. Right. And, uh, you know, she keeps turning towards him and he's acting really coy and nonchalant about it. And this is the first time we see him get rejected. So we learn something about Reggie's character here yeah. that he's interested in saving the day. But he's more interested in sweet, he wants sweet to Poontang. bang the chick in the movie all the time. All the time. <laughs> well, to the point where you start to question his actual motives right. in these movies. If he really is in it to help Mike out, or if he just likes meeting chicks on the... He's in the wrong genre if he wants to drive his car around and meet chicks on the side of the road. That's true. But he's in the right genre if he wants to uh, get out of committed relationships as quick as possible. So he and Rocky and this kid go off to save Mike or kill the tall man or both. 
And, um, you know, we start to learn about the weaknesses of the tall man and get a little bit more background there. Right. We have that flashback to the first film. Sure. Where the tall man doesn't like the cold. Yeah. In so, the, in the, when I saw the first time, I thought that the tall man liked the cold. Yeah. I didn't know what was going on in that scene. Or he smelled a really good burger. He stops. Oh, well, I think it's, isn't it the ice cream truck the he ice walks cream by? Truck. Yeah, and he sort of turns to the side and looks. What's he doing, like, out in I town? <laughs> I don't know. He's just wandering stroll. about. He's wandering about. It was weird. Of course, I remember the scene from that movie, because I believe it's the only scene where the tall man's not walking through a door. He's out having a stroll. And so, you know, we do this thing that's great, and they're finally capitalizing on, all right, we're three films in. We can go back. We have the same characters. We have the same actors. The people responsible for Phantasm Three are all the same people who are responsible for Phantasm One. So they're going to go back, they're going to pull from their previous work, and they're going to drop it in the third movie. To kind of flesh it out and explain what's going on and, I guess, support their retcons. Well, yeah, and make it seem like there's more subtext to the first film than there actually was. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a great way to just fucking stroke your ego there, is say, oh, you thought that uh, that first film was a little obvious? You uh, You thought you totally got that? Well... Remember the weird scene where he walks by the cold that you never question? Yeah, here's why that's important. I don't think anyone actually thought that. I think everybody saw that first movie and was confused. So they Mm. probably didn't need to do it, but they did it anyways. (laughs) And then they start answering these questions. I mean, questions that no one was asking. They answer, what are the chrome balls? Right. Was that your question? Is that really what you were concerned with? Um, Not really. I think there's a lot more pressing questions in here. Right. What are the chrome balls? Uh, not, Not really one that needed answering. But we know they have brain parts or something. They have in brains, them. and they were at one point people. They've been trapped there. See, I'm excited for this, because I think, you know, the movie finally knows where it's at. It has these stupid little spheres that fly around and shoot pus or uh, blood out of your brain yeah. or whatever. And they're kind of scary, and they're cool looking, and... They're also dumb balls. They're not, uh, they're not stolen from A New Hope, is what I'm getting at. <laughs> you know what I mean? The movie's coming into its own. It's saying, hey, here's something we clearly created. We didn't realize how amazing it was at the time. Let's make the movie all about that now. There's thousands of them. Yeah. You were talking about Alien. I mean, that's a, that's a total yeah. Aliens vibe, right? Absolutely. Oh, now there's a bunch. Yeah. Be really fucking scared of that. And then the movie ends on its, I guess it's kind of one-liner. It's never over the uh the grab and then the credits yeah you know everybody being totally fucked at the end and the third film is is probably this is a good moment to just briefly touch on angus scrim as the tall man sure because by the fourth film i'm not sure who he is because he has a different name okay i think he's absolutely one of the greatest things to ever happen to a horror franchise well, let's talk about that a bit as we get into this fourth film. Right. I'm going to make a goddamn chapter right here. Sweet. Angus Scrim. Now we know everything about him. In yeah. fact, more than we wanted to know. Yeah. So before we get to the Civil War. You mean after we've gotten to the Civil War, but then returned Who would have... I mean, I can't even believe we're at a point where I'm saying, oh, the fourth Phantasm movie. You mean the Civil War one? Yeah. But by now we're full on sci-fi. I mean, the third really solidified it. The third was we were talking about other planets and creatures and dimensions and stuff. But now it's got a huge sci-fi plot, too. It's, uh, it's the film with time travel. And the telekinesis. So, yeah, aliens or another dimension or something. Which, by the way, at the end of the film, I still don't really know if it's aliens or another dimension or yeah. what. I don't know why we're talking about aliens. There's still... We get a Civil War backstory, which we'll get into in a second. But then there's a, there's a missing gap. You know, step one is Civil War. Step two is a big fucking mystery. And then step three is our modern... Uh, Tall man Mm -hmm. or prophet. Right. So we're saying, all right, we're going to go back and tell you the story. But the step two is really the important one. Yeah. He disappears for a little while. We don't know. And then he comes back and he's the tall man. So aliens at that point? Is that where aliens? There's this horrible thing where Mike, who is now an alien, I guess, or at least a robot-y thing. Yeah. Which we can maybe assume is what happened to the tall man. I don't know. But not really because he doesn't have metal eyes and he melts. Oh, God. Um. But Mike goes back in time and meets kindly old Mr. Morningside on his veranda. Okay, so before Mr. Morningside, what do we love about the tall man? Before we ruin it for everybody. (laughs) See, I'm in the same boat you are on this, and this is interesting for me. I love the tall man. I do not know why I love the tall man. Yeah. I think he is so fucking cool. Nothing about him is cool. I don't. (laughs) He's a creepy old guy, and he walks weird. And he's in slow motion all the time. I just like, I think what I like about the tall man is that he's not terrifying in the conventional sense. Sure. He's 
very foreboding and right. he's very heavy. He's like a fucking freight train. Sure. I mean, think about it in the exact terminology of a goddamn freight train. Okay. There's this freight train going down train tracks. Sure. Yeah. Carrying freight accordion people. Okay, great. Now, that freight train is huge and massive and powerful and you will would under no circumstances would you approach the freight train. Don't want to be in its way. Totally got you. And if you're not in its way, he probably won't ever fuck with you. But the second you're in the way of the freight train, you are dead. Okay. You Devastation. Are absolutely sure. fucked. See, I'm, I think it's a little bit more of the Tom Noonan kind of the house of the devil thing. Sure, sure. I think it's a little bit more creepy. What is this guy up to? He's he's too proper to be this evil. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, so when we go back and we discover Civil War Morningside, I think a lot of that defines, just like when we were talking about Wishmaster and by the second film, the actor knew the things in the first movie that you know made him iconic. Right. Phantasm illustrates that it knows those things as well by betraying those things instead of indulging in those right. things. It's not saying I'm going to be an amped up version of the tall man from the preview. I'm going to be even fucking taller than I was last movie <laughs> and everybody's going to fear me. We get taller and right. manlier. Right. So we go back to the Civil War and instead it's, look at this kindly old gentleman. This really is Angus Scrim showing off in the way that he said he could when uh, when he was introducing the first movie to us. He's just saying, oh, I can play a totally different character. I'm going to be a nice, humble old gentleman. I'm going to offer you some of my sun tea or lemonade or whatever the fuck that was. And I'm going to be married to the blind lady that was in the first film for an arbitrary throwback. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You remember her? Well, I hope you do because we drug her out in the fourth <laughs> film. This is not a jump the shark moment for me. The movie can still turn back and go into the the original dimension. It, I mean, it's completely fine. It could just give us a preview of what existed somewhere else in time and space and then just come right back to reality. These movies are about betraying reality anyway, mm -hmm. so I, that doesn't really bother me. But this is also the film that points out that cars only blow up in movies. Yeah. Wow. I think that was the moment. I think that was... That was it for you? I think that was it for me. Um... If it wasn't, it was the moment where he wakes up next to the girl whose breasts have been replaced by shiny spheres. Uh -huh. Here I thought we might actually get another female protagonist in sure. these movies. Uh, nope, no women. Just no, she here to... spheres, and surprise, she's one of the bad guys. Oh, God. I mean, none of this is really important. This isn't the stuff I'm going to remember. You know, what this movie is about is the strange way in which it uh, came into being. Mm -hmm. or and I guess why what it is what it is. Yeah, right. What it's composed of. I care, I guess, even less about why this movie exists, but more what it's doing. But I guess there's a little why it exists that's that's kind of important. There's um, uh, Roger Avery had written this script, and I guess we'll make this really short. Uh, Roger Avery's done a bunch of stuff. You can look him up. Uh, worked with Tarantino on some stuff. We've covered some of that stuff before on the show. He wrote this script for... A, uh, I guess what would be a Phantasm Five, right? And while it was stuck in development, Phantasm, hell, what was it? Phantasm nineteen ninety nine A D. Nineteen ninety nine A D. Yeah, that was it. It was uh, it was a chasing the semi movie. Right. It was the borrowing apocalyptic uh, images from Road Warrior right, movies. Right. We're gonna have a post apocalyptic. Hey, it's two years after Couldn't the movie. Couldn't get Mel Gibson, about. but yeah, the right. world has ended and there will be cars. We're just going to do Road Warrior again. And uh, with Phantasm, I don't know who yeah. thought that was a good idea, Roger Avery. And so stuck in development hell, uh, Don chooses to just make another movie that's going to be kind of the setup sure. for it's this. the stepping stone. What will now be a glorious fifth film in the yeah. franchise. They saved an hour and a half of our time by not making that film. Yep. Although maybe it would come out and be amazing. I it's don't know. totally something that is, possible. is a possibility. It would make it a good solid five, Killapalooza. So we come up with this movie, and this movie is the cheap, cobbled together out of sure. old footage movie. Out of outtaken footage. Beautiful. Sleepaway Camp 4. Right. Is this movie. With a lot of voiceover. By now we've had a lot of these previously on montage scenes, and we're getting them in the beginning of this movie, and it's just serving to remind us, not to explain to us what's going on, but just to say, hey, it's been a while since you've seen these movies, you remember all of these different scenes, weren't they cool, that's kind of where our characters are at now, here's mm -hmm. what they've gone through. But then the exposition kicks in. And if you're going to give exposition, you might as well do it over a dark highway at nighttime, right? I mean, where else would you do that? Just That's another, just more Terminator, more Terminator on this podcast. So this becomes the one where, hey, we're going to explain things. We're going to sit down with the audience. Yeah. We're going to say, this is why the things happened in the order they did. 
here's what we're doing moving forward. And here's a bajillion tuning fork gates that we never go back to. Oh, yeah, yeah all the fucking tuning forks. So I'm going to hold this movie up for doing something cool, for okay. doing something really, really cool in a way that's, I mean, it's pretty awesome. It, we feared when we talked about the hypothetical Sleepaway Camp 4 that it would just be old scenes uh-huh. and they would all be kind of cut together and it would be boring and bad. Sure, and, especially since we had just watched the other movies. Well, yeah. I mean, the last thing we wanted to sit through is a montage of all of the Well, the last films. thing we want to sit through is 40 minutes of the previous film narrated by Eric Freeman. Still not over that, huh? The pain just... Eric Freeman gave us garbage day. I don't know if we can... We can Ooh, blame him. Red car. Nice one. Phantasm 4 is here to completely exploit what we've only previously been hinting at. We're going to use full-on, you know, unused footage from other films. We're going to not take extended scenes or really variations of scenes, but scenes that never made it into the other movies, and we are going to put them together in some kind of backstory, remember when. I mean, here's how you know this is good. When we first saw it, we were both thinking, wow, how did they get these actors to look like they used to? Right. Who did they cast as this kid? Yeah. Who how did they, how did they shrink Michael Baldwin? Right. And it's not until the second or third time they do this where we start to really notice it. I mean, I didn't, you notice one. I didn't even uh, yeah. notice when we were going back to Angus's character from the first movie. I mean, I completely overlooked it. I just assumed up oh, that's Angus. They made him right. look a little younger somehow. And then they, uh, they hanged him in a tree. Yeah, right. And instead, they completely pulled that stuff from uh, the cutting room floor of previous movies, stuck it together, and then kind of assembled a plot around it. I think that is brilliant. It is. That it, that I exists. Mean, and, and there were moments where they used outtakes where I was like, how did they, how did they have that plan? Yeah, right. They've right. had that plan for 20 years. Sure. It's, uh, they take the footage, and then they weave a story around it. But it does absolutely have that effect. You watch it and you think they never could, especially the ending scene. Sure. Or I guess the hanging scene too. It's, uh, you see it and you go, they had such great foresight <laughs> to right. create this. Instead of thinking, wow, they really, it's super forced and right. they did a good job reverse engineering it. Phantasm for a long time was a perfect series. Yeah. For approximately 75% uh, of the series. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to give Phantasm shit for any of the stuff it's really sucking up. I, I will, but. I we need to talk about the Star Wars thing just yeah. really quick. Okay, all right, it's intervention time. Mm-hmm. I've held this down as long as I could. Well, now we're literally not only are we doing Jawas, but we're doing them in sand dunes. Doing man. them in we're sand dunes with secret Tuscan Raiders. Fucking Tuscan Raiders, right? So not only are we on Tatooine, we are in these fucking sandy dunes, and there's Jawas hiding behind rocks. And then just for no reason, there's a guy in the background with one of the masks, which was you know previously in the other movies. Uh-huh. But they pan by him fast enough that he looks like a sand person. Yep. He looks like a fucking Tuscan Raider. These are just scenes from A New Hope. These can't be accidental anymore, right? This no, has to be a joke. definitely Jawas. Do you think this is intentional? I mean... It's difficult. If it were the third movie, I would say yes. But this They is... even cut to the sun. The sun yep. is the transition yep. for... I mean, it's only one sun instead of yeah. two. But... Uh, I think it's probably intentional, but I'm not going to... I don't want to go on record and say it is. All right. I will, because that'll give them credit rather than tearing them down. So, hey, that was really funny that you finally called yourself out on using fucking Jawas. So, tuning forks or something, they're a weapon. We get to the end. There's a gates to other dimensions. Uh, does Civil War, Angus, ruin it for you? I mean, is it... It doesn't ruin it for me. I kind it's of okay, wish, right? I wish... I think, I think the one thing that the Phantasm franchise is missing for me is I want to know what the hell is going on with the tall man. <laughs> sure. I want to know what he is. I want to know what he really looks like. Sure. And I want to know where he's from. You know, it's funny because I didn't care about any of that shit until they invoked it. Right. And then I got myself mentally geared up to do that. And instead, they just told us who the tall man was before yeah. he was the tall man. Exactly. They still left out that huge piece that suddenly I didn't give a fuck before. Now I want to know. Right. And the other thing is whenever you see that other dimension, his home planet or whatever, it's just red with a bunch of Jawas. <laughs> sure. It doesn't. It's like the the actual large city is just over the horizon. Yeah. So you really you get no background of the sky. And that's really that's the biggest problem for me. That said, I kind of really like Phantasm. Uh, Phantasm's fucking great. So if we go back over these four movies, and I uh-huh. want to ask you the, the age-old double feature question. Yes. Not what the fuck does a producer do, but okay. rather where would you go with these films? 
Where would I go? With so the we Phantasm film? we'll backtrack a little bit. In the first movie, Mike is just a little tiny baby. He's yep. a kid. They wander around in the graveyard. They're riding some motorbikes, and they're best of friends. And they're in a, a crappy porch band. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I really wish they'd come back to the porch band. Uh-huh. That's that's my only. Um, that's where I would continue the franchise. Uh-huh. They would rock out more. But they have that uh, little scene of them in front of the fireplace. We set up our series, mm-hmm. which would make the second film. Uh, second film is more badass, funnier. That's the uh, that's the one with. Um, that's the flamethrower movie. The, yeah, it's the flamethrower. It's the the introduction to quad gun. It's the it's the it's the ice cream man strikes back. That's exactly what it is. Is ice cream man strikes back? All right. So second film, and I'm totally behind that. And I think that's probably one of my favorites from the the series. It's hard to say something like, that's one of my favorites when there's four movies. Uh I like the second one the best, I think. I'm with you. Awesome. The third one, then, is the road trip movie with uh, another kid. We get a kid, but we also get Michael back. And jokes. um, And jokes. There's definitely some humor to it. The main joke, I remember, being outside of the uh, hotel place. We also continue some stuff on with the tall man. We kind of realize what makes... Uh, The movie's iconic, where the terror comes from or is supposed to come from. And um, I say that because I think it leans more towards sci-fi at this point than it does real terror. It's not really trying to scare you as much as, uh, you know, be gross, late night sci-fi stuff. And then the fourth movie. The fourth movie is the one where Mike successfully travels through the gate multiple times. Yeah, and who really knows what happens at the end of that movie. So we get to that point, and we've gone in something of a, a circle. I guess that's safe sure. to say. Uh, where do you do you go from there? I mean, I guess this this perhaps could be spoilery, right? Sure. This kind of tells you where the franchise ended up. Right. Maybe it's time to chapter on out of here. Yeah. But uh, where where do you take a franchise like this? You know, I think I think the the way the way that you get uh, Phantasm back on the track it needs to be on is you uh, you take an army against. The tall man, not like an army army. I'm not talking a military army, sure. but I'm talking, uh, a, you know, an you want underground an organization. Sure. At, this is, I mean, maybe it is the post-apocalyptic thing, right? Maybe we're in a universe where we have essentially been enslaved by the tall man and his Jawa slaves. <laughs> sure. Right. And there's an underground resistance that's going to, you know, take the power back. Awesome. Um, But, you know, I don't want laser beams. You I don't want, want laser beams I, out of it. I don't want lasers. I don't want anything that's going to make loud noises. I don't want spaceships. I want people with fucking crowbars that are just experts at smacking the shiny spheres out of the sky. I would love to see Gordon Freeman in these movies just as much as you would. But I think uh, what's great about the end of the fourth movie is that they've set themselves up for their own reboot. Yeah. They have set themselves up in a position where they could potentially play out these events again in a slightly different manner, right. even give them an excuse to play sure. around with a different cast right. and have the events transpire differently, sure. but keep it in the same canon. They created that awesome kind of out for them where they can wrap up on their own terms their own franchise. And even if someone else were to start another franchise, you could include it in the canon and it wouldn't disrupt anything they're doing. And now everybody knows about Phantasm. Great. Awesome. Got that done. Okay. Red text. Red text and a website, which is donate.doublefeatureshow.com. Yep. That is our official homepage. This uh, this donate thing was almost, almost a complete success last time. Almost. But, you know, we've lost a couple subscribers since then, and uh, it's been a, a rocky few months. It's the video games. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's all the video game references. It makes people leave. I'm really sorry about that. Donate.doublefeatureshow.com. We're uh, we're using our Killapaloozas as pledge drives. And you know what this has actually done that's been great is it has isolated all the periods in which people donate to specifically just when we have a Killapalooza. Uh-huh. Although it hasn't increased them in number. So actually what it did <laughs> is just get people to stop donating the rest of the time. So, uh, hey guys, we're, we're still around. If you want to maybe give us some money, that'd be pretty cool, huh? What was the website? Uh, I believe it's donate.doublefeatureshow.com. We're working on a video thing. Uh, oh, yeah. The video thing, I don't think we want to say anything about it, right? But we're going to work on a video thing, and okay. you're going to love it, and then you're going to give us more money. It's going to be um, it's going to be very double feature centric. Last time you and I did a video thing, you were on a stage being a badass, yeah. and I was filming you, and yeah. uh, we created a little music video thing. 
And, you know, people like that, but they wanted uh, more boobs and more violence. Sure. I don't know if this new video will have either of those things because those cost a lot of money, but it will be more double feature related kind of uh, narrative. And we'd really love some extra money to do that. But first we need to like get some money to pay for the show. Mm -hmm. So thanks in advance for that. And we'll keep you updated on video stuff. Um, We have two more movies. Yeah. We're just going to go back down to two next week. That's probably for the best. Yeah. Four is, I mean, we could have kicked out two shows by now. Sure. What the hell? Uh, But yeah, we're going to do some, um, let's call it a failed settlement double feature. We're going to do uh, Ravenous and Jonestown. I only know about half of these. Oh, this is kind of old school, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm I'm bringing half, and you're bringing half, and we're going to see what a terrible, wonderful time it is. Great. Watch more fucking film. Bye.